So where do we use uh, hierarchical data? And uh, most data has some sort of a hierarchy to it. And there's genealogical trees, uh, comment post threads, company organizational charts, parts, parts lists, relationships, you know, engine parts and how they go together, and various category, subcategory relationships. They're used quite often to create those what they call um, crumb, crumb trails? Breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. There we go. I was um, type of thing for following uh, how you got to a particular location. And there's a lot of different strategies. Um, the two main ones I'm going to be covering are adjacency list and nested set. Um, there's also path enumeration, which I'm not going to cover. Closure tables, which I haven't tried, uh, though they sound potentially interesting. And there's also modifications of all of these. And while it's in the references at the back, this is a fairly good book. Uh, it's a little tough in some areas. It's called Joe Selko's Trees and Hierarchies in SQL for Smarties. Yeah, they, they do expect you to know a bit here. Um, I don't follow all of it yet. So adjacency list, and I'll show you what it is here in a minute, but the main advantage to an adjacency list, it's really easy to insert new values into the tree. Uh, disadvantages. The more levels you have of your tree, the harder it is to retrieve them. It takes more processing power, the queries get more complicated, and so on. Um, so a simple tree here. We've got computer. Underneath that we have programming. Underneath that we have languages. Underneath that we have four or five languages. Graphics, still under computer, has some subcategories and some other subcategories. Databases under computer has a couple categories and so on. So we're about one, two, three, four. We go a total of five levels here. Now, you could argue whether this is the best way to organize this, but we'll assume that this is our tree. We want to represent this in MySQL, be able to update it, retrieve information, and use it. Now, the, the model for this is actually pretty simple. Um, I've got a table here called uh, basically adjacent categories, it has a category ID, it has the name of the category, and then there's a parent category ID which has a self-join to the category ID, um, one to many within the table itself. So, you know, real basic, it's got an integer for the category ID, it's a primary key, auto increment, category name, I limited it to a very care of 30, and the parent category ID, and I did say that the category name had to be unique, and then I set up the foreign key. So this is one of those fun things where I'm actually going to do this. I've blanked out the database. So if you see, I've got uh, the basic information schema. I've got a database for this talk, MySQL trees. And then, of course, there's the test database I use with my students because I just love starting out the class typing, use the force. Because, yes, we have a what database called that. So I'm going to use, sorry, MySQL trees. And let's make that a little bit bigger. And I seem to have, oh, there it is. The mouse can be a little bit of a pain sometimes. Ah. So paste that in, paste that in. So I've got my table set up now. And I am going to do some of the initial inserts. Um, not showing. Yeah, that's what I thought I did. OK. Um, so I'm just going to do the kind of top level stuff. Whatever you decide for the topmost either has to have an ID of zero, though usually it's better to just give it an ID of null. So the very, very top of my tree system is computer. And therefore, programming one, graphics one, I'm taking advantage of the fact, and this is of course somewhat dangerous, that unless I do something wrong, I know that computer should get the primary key value of one. This is laziness on my part. It's not safe. But I left this there for that. Uh, 
Okay. And, you know, select star from, how was it, AG categories. Yep. So, you know, we've got our top level ones that are just below the topmost level, which is computer. But we don't want to keep having to do it this way. It's very easy to make mistakes. So we're going to create a couple of helper functions, and then we're going to create a procedure and let that do the inserts for us. Have it do the lookups, have it do some of the sanity checking, and so on. So I'm creating two real simple helper functions um, using you know, the MySQL routine language. Um, it basically can get category ID, so if you pass it the name, it'll get you the ID, or if you pass it the ID, it'll get you the name. They're really pretty silly, uh, but they work. Oh, I forgot to drop, I dropped the table, but I didn't drop the function, so they already exist. And I'm assuming the procedure is still there too because I haven't dropped it. This basically just simply, I give it the category name and the name of the parent I want. It then finds the parent category ID by selecting the name put into the get category ID function. So what that function does, and am I staying, I'm trying to glue my feet right here. Um, so what that does is you give it the name, maybe you want the pa uh, parent category to be programming, the function takes that and returns the category ID, and I store that in a temporary session variable, pcat ID. And then I check to see if it's not null, then I insert into the adjacent categories, category name, and then the parent category ID. Um, works pretty well. It's only got a partial sanity check. I make sure that you can't assign a parent category ID that doesn't exist. But this will fail if you try to insert the same category name again, because I do have a unique key on that, but nothing in this function double checks to see if you're not trying to insert an existing category name. I just check to make sure that the parent exists. I don't check to see if the category I'm trying to insert already exists. The only thing that prevents duplicates is the fact I set a unique key in the table when I created it. Otherwise, this would happily let you put in the same category over and over and over again, which could be a bit of a mess. And again, I could try and create it, but I'm fairly certain this one still is there from my talk. I just dropped the tables. I didn't think to drop everything else. So I could then basically populate it, just call that procedure and pass it in whatever order I want to, the uh, name and then the name that I want to be the parent. So languages has a parent of programming, JavaScript has a parent of languages, PHP has a parent of languages. You get the idea. So I basically have recreated that tree with just a series of calls. And again, I'm kind of dumping it all at once, but you could easily use a procedure call in you know, your web interface or whatever else you're using. So show tables here. Select star from categories. And you can see that we have, looks like pretty good here. Sphinx is a parent of 28, which is under NoSQL. That looks good. Procedures has a parent of 24, which is under routines. It, from the quick look, it looks like I didn't make any goofs for that. So it has created the tree set. Okay, that's great. We got it in there. Now, can we use it? Um, it's simple levels. One level at a time isn't too big a deal. So if I want the category ID and the category name from that table, where the parent category ID equals programming. So I want to find all the direct children of the programming part, no problem. Uh, if I want to find all the direct children of languages, again, no problem. One level, really easy. Two levels, three levels, four levels, it can get to be a bit more complex. So we could just run these real quick. And again, I'm just using those little helper query uh, functions so I don't have to do a whole bunch of subqueries, even though technically I'm cheating and those are subqueries. 
So I could find you know the name there, and if I want the copy of this one. So programming has one child, languages, and languages has five children, which is so on. Now, you could see how you could just kind of do iterative queries if you want to rebuild a branch or a tree. Um, so that's one way to get around it. Questions or comments as we're moving along here? That's why I sound like a naive and dumb question, but uh, can uh, this be replicated after doing this together? Windows tree? In what windows? As a, as a windows tree from, uh, from the, to uh, take a database and create. Oh, could you do it in like Microsoft SQL versus MySQL? Um, most of these queries are pretty close. They're, you will have to probably double check a couple of things. I've, I've actually had to sub a couple times for Microsoft SQL, so I've looked at their procedure language. It's very similar, but you'll probably have to do a few minor changes. Might be so different. No, I, I meant a little different. I meant a, uh, can it be recreated from this to a Windows, uh, Windows Manager, Windows tree, file tree, tree? Oh, you mean can you use this for a directory tree? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, Again, a directory tree in many ways is just a classic upside down tree hierarchy. Um, so yeah, you could use these with directory the systems and for Linux and Windows are different, so. No, this isn't file system. Oh, oh, okay. No, this is this is MySQL database, which you can run on, on Windows, but this is storing it in a relational database so you can query it, retrieve it. This is just data. It doesn't actually directly connect to the underlying file system. Now, you could use it to mimic it or keep track of directories for like all your media if you're running something like YouTube. But it itself is just text that's inserted into a database. Um, the meaning it has is whatever meaning you give it. At least I think that's what your question was. We might have to ask that afterwards. I may not quite understand the question, and I'm sorry about that. So, um, trying to find parents of the children. So we could find the kids. Now we need to find the parents. Oops. Ah, uh, well, effectively, if you have non-existent parents, you have what is known as a pruned branch sitting out there in space. Yeah, it's an orphan branch. Yeah. And there are queries that you can use to do that. I, I think I've got some queries in here where we do some pruning in the rest. Because um, there's... But this, this handle, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't air around. It gets, yeah. keeps it around. Right, it keeps it around. If I delete a parent... The only issue that you're going to run into, because I've actually used it as a foreign key, and I don't have a on delete uh, cascade, is that it won't let you delete it without updating the parent value. But that's just because how I structured the table. That's got nothing inherent in the model itself. So yeah, if you try to create delete a parent right now that has children, while well, those foreign keys are pointing to that parent ID, which means that the foreign uh, racial, uh, Foreign key referential integrity will kick in and go, uh uh, you can't delete that without updating it. Well, on the other hand, you could populate a pruned branch, and once it's pretty much in the database, you could connect it to a parent. Yes, and that's the thing. It's very easy because whoever's at the top of a particular branch, all you have to do is set their parent ID, and boom, they're now part of the rest of it. So you can move stuff around pretty easily here. When we get to nested sets, you're going to realize that that's not as easy a thing to do. You have to do a bit more math and a huge amount of changes to the table. So we look here. I'm just going through and getting the parents. Um, and so computer has programming as a child, as graphics as a child, as database as a child, 
And again, I could potentially, you know, do some grouping stuff here, but we are indeed able to find all the kids. So again, we can pull out the relationships. It's just building the complete tree um, takes a bit more work. I mean, this is all the pieces, and it's kind of tells you where to snap them together, but it's all a bunch of pieces. Okay. And you can kind of make some variations on these. Again, when I was developing this, I was just kind of playing around in the audience and just came up with some variations on this. And if you look at my sources, you'll see a lot of my code is pretty well lifted here. So what I've done is I've just grouped them by parent. So here's our parents and all of their children as a comma separated list using group concat and so on. Um, so you can easily use this in something like a web interface to loop through to recreate the tree. I've got all the parents. I've got a comma separated list of the IDs for the children. Again, the information is there. It's just not always in the nice, neat method you want here. Um, and we could do the same thing and just use my little function to give it names so you can see that better. I forgot the S. Yeah. Okay, so computer, and it has the children of programming, graphics, databases, and web design. Programming only has the child of languages. Languages has JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, Python, Java. So I just do this so you can so that those numbers are actually correct, because otherwise you could go. Right, numbers 3, 5, 14, and 22 are actually, I'll, I'll have to take your word for it. So I just did this so you can actually see that it does indeed have the information from that tree that I showed you. Okay, now you can potentially get everything by joining the table to itself, to itself, to itself, to itself. Yeah. So as there's five levels, I am aliasing the same table as T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. And I am basically looking at the T1 cat name as level 1, T2 cat name as level 2, T3 cat name as level 4, and repeat all the way through T5. And then I've got those insane set of joins, and I'm starting it at computer. So it'll go five levels down from computer. If I were to give it a different name to start on, it would do a smaller portion of the tree. This one took a little while to type up. So you'll see computer. Below that is programming. Below that is languages, below that is JavaScript, and there's nothing below that. Computer, programming, languages, PHP, and so on. Now you'll see that there's only one where I go all the way to level five, and that's where I've got routines and procedures and functions. So this is, again, another way of showing the tree structure. Obviously, you could collapse down the duplicates here, um, but the tree structure is there. It can be retrieved, and this is... You know, five levels, you're getting quite a few joins. And if the table is fairly big, it's going to be joined to itself that many times. Um, this can get to be a little rough if you're trying to recreate the entire tree. I would argue it's probably better to do find the parents and then iterate down that branch, go to the next parent, iterate down that branch rat with whatever web interface you're using rather than trying to do this purely in SQL. It can get to be a little intense on the database side if you've got a large data set. Okay. Now, if we want to find out where the ends of the branches are, we could just basically look for where the parent, uh, they don't have any kids, basically. So, 
These are Blender. Yep, there's nothing underneath that. Cassandra, there's nothing underneath that. GIMP, Inkscape, Java, JavaScript. Nothing under any of these, I don't believe. Um, so these are your terminal nodes. So you can find that information. Now, I want to delete a node, but promote all the children up. So basically, I'm going to kill a parent, and effectively, that dead parent's parent becomes the parent of their kids. You know, I guess it's one of those time travel things where you go back and you end up being your grandfather type of thing. Um, so here we're going to just give it the name of the category that we want to delete. Um, setting the new parent equal to the um, parent of the one we're about to delete. Because remember, I'm here, I'm about to die. I need to know my parent's ID. So when I go away, my kids can now have that as their parent. And basically, I pruned a chunk and attached it on. And then I find the old parent um, where it's just simply the ID of that. And I update category set parent category ID equal to new parent where the PCAT ID is presently equal to the old parent. And then and only then delete from there the category that I had. So I, I effectively have to reparent all the kids before I can kill the parent off. And again, this one should probably already be in there. So I'm just going to delete NoSQL, which has the parents of like Sphinx, Cassandra, and Mongo, I believe. Oops. Too many windows open here. Okay, you're going, well, I'll have to take your word for it. No, let's actually run a query and see what it does here. So, um, query that I would go back real quick is, ah, heck, let's just run this one again. See how it's different. So notice, NoSQL is missing. Mongo, Cassandra, and Sphinx are now under databases instead of under NoSQL. So I basically got rid of NoSQL and reparented all of their kids up one. So compared to some of the other models, JSONC list is very easy to update, or relatively easy. Uh, you can retrieve the, the tree, but the more levels you go, the more complicated it can be, especially if you're trying to do it all at once. And again, if you're going to do a whole bunch of self-joins because you want all those levels, well, joins, of course, add to the complexity and the space and the RAM and everything else that it needs. And potentially, you could just use the comma-separated list from that group concat in a web script and have your web script produce the rest of the tree. Because you, you've got the IDs, you've got all the other information, just, you know, do it that way. Before I go on to the next model, assuming we have time, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Um, questions on, on this, as much as I possibly can. Some of them may have to be done afterwards, but. Here's a question. How many people have ever thought about putting hierarchical data in a relational database before? Okay. How many of you done the, have done the adjacency list model? Well, that I I, I don't want to ask that. That's a we've got some 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 gray neck beards here, so I don't really want to ask that question because I would have to admit, you know, <clears throat> what millennium I started using Linux in, and that's uh, already a little rough. Um, well, like I said, you can use it for any case where you need to keep track of a relationship between things. It could be between the parts list. It could be trying to keep a track of who replied to which post in a thread war on some discussion board. Though a lot of people will use nowadays things like 
Mongo or Cassandra report, but yes. Could be used for keeping track of inventory and sub inventory kits that would yep. go together to be shipped to a customer. Yep. Is this sort of similar in how Elastopress or uh, Elasticsearch works? Kind of how it has that, that almost JSON style. I know this is instead of JSON, even though technically now MySQL has a JSON data type. Still hurts my head when I realize it. Elasticsearch is using MongoDB yeah. instead of MySQL. Yeah. This is basically how to do the same thing in a relational database. Because this is one of the arguments is that you're going to have to automatically use a non-SQL database um, in order to do this. And there are definitely arguments for that. But depending on what you're doing, you can still do it in a relational database. And if you're careful, it might even be pretty fast. If you're not careful, it's a disaster. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with Elasticsearch, but that doesn't surprise me that it doesn't use this. Okay, well, next one here. And this one I did specifically for that because I hadn't played with it before. I mean, I've read about it, but it's one thing to read about something and another to actually do it. So this was an example of me not knowing a few of the features of Inkscape as well as I wanted to before I did this. So this is an, another way of setting up that exact same data. And I've got a link here to the website that I use very heavily for this. Uh, to say a lot of my code was basically just slightly modified from their site. So I got to give them credit for this. But so we've got computer. And the way it works is that instead of using primary foreign key, you have what's known as a left value and a right value. And your overall top level parent will go from one to the largest number in the list. So in our case, computer goes from one to 20. Programming goes from 2 to 9. Databases goes from 10 to 19. Within programming, which goes from 2 to 9, we have 3 to 8 for languages. Within languages, we now have 4 to 5 and 6 to 7. 4 to 5 is PHP, 6 to 7 is Python. For databases, which goes from 10 to 19, you have 11 to 14 for SQL, and I only had room for one, 12 to 13 for MySQL. Uh, no SQL, 15 to 18, and Mongo inside of it goes from 16 to 17. So this is what they call nested sets, um, where they're nested between the numbers. Now, figuring out the tree is pretty reasonably easy. Doing updates, depending on how you set this up, can be nightmarish. Because if I decide that I want to add um, something into programming, right? so I'm going to add a value into programming. And it's going to potentially go before uh, languages. Well, OK, 2 is OK, but 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way through 20 are going to have to be updated to make room. So if you have a few thousand categories nested in here, and you decide to do an insert towards the top of the tree, you may be changing a few thousand rows. Um, and there are procedures to do it. I mean, it, it's, it's doable. But if you're doing a lot of rapid updates, I would probably argue this is probably really not the way to go if you're doing something like blog posts or comment threads that have to update really quickly. But it can be done. So simpler table. There's no primary keys involved here. I've got a category ID, the category name, and an L value and an R value. That's it. Um, Nothing too exciting there. And I will just do one initial insert, which is the parent with the computer that starts at 1 and ends at 2. And I'm going to have a set of procedure calls that are just going to keep, each one is going to keep moving everything over by updating those values. And we'll do that initial insert. So 
Whoops. Okay, I accidentally apparently copied everything below it, which is one of the things that does happen with reveal from time to time. Because that's not what I meant to do. Apparently, yep. <coughs> you have to be kind of careful when you're highlighting within reveal here. Because this is actually all one web page. It's just being treated as if it's different ones. So I also, I'm surprised it didn't totally blow up with the procedure to do inserts text, but eh, whatever. Um, so we have our procedure here to nest, uh, add categories to a nested set. Again, it takes a category name and a parent category name. And this is where I have to find out where the new right value is going to be um, by selecting the L value from there where basically looking where the range is. And then I do a whole bunch of R value plus two and L value plus two where R value is greater than the new right value. Um, and so on. So this, these two lines are going to do an awful lot of inserts. And then once I've updated all the left and right values, now I put in the new one. And that means that every time I call this procedure, depending on where I put it, say it starts at number five, well, it's now going to go from number six to how many thousands you have and have to update every single one. And then I meant to do these procedures where I'm basically adding in all those new categories. And, oh wow, did I really get that? Apparently so, just by going one line too far. I still want to work on that. Yeah, let's take a look at what's in there here. So it apparently started right here. So show tables, let's make sure nothing weird happened here. Select star from, whoops. Nested cats, oops, nested underscore cats. And we had a problem. I was afraid of that. So we've got from 1 to 46, but we've got a few that for whatever reason, because of I copied and pasted the wrong stuff, uh, there's a few things that are kind of stuck. So everything is inside a computer. But then almost everything apparently got stuck inside of graphics as well. Um, and databases goes from 2 to 27, which is, oh, I don't know, sorry, graphics is only from 28 to 45, so that's not too bad. From 2 to 27 is databases. Um, so it's correct except for those five or six. <sighs> Want me to just drop it and start over? Let me ask you, the, the right value of the first one, the 46, yeah. how, this, how, did, how did this number come about? Well, every time I run that procedure and I go to insert, now computer is top, so that one will never change. But it just simply adds two as appropriate to everything below it and then inserts the value. So at first, that was one, two. I did my first insert. Well, now it's one, two, three, four. So now it's one to four. Do the next one. Well, now it's going to be one to six, and then one to eight, and then one to. So for that very first one, because of how I'm doing it, it's always going to be an even value. Not necessarily true for some of the others. Um, and it just keeps increasing that way. Because you're putting everything inside of everything, so the values have to be recalculated pretty well every time. This is where I should have a separate window to copy and paste from. So let's see how much damage I did here. It's, it's potentially fixable, but I don't think you really want to sit here and watch me do that. So this is basically the procedures that were supposed to go in there. And I could potentially try to drop those five or six that were bad and just re-add this and see if it will put it in the appropriate numbers. It might. Uh, I don't think I really designed it to handle that kind of a little mistake, but well, I could try this. 
one of those things I warn my students not to do. Oh, hey, I forgot a wear clause. Okay. Everything gone, right? So, I'm going to be a little bit more careful this time. And for this, put on the cheaters here. And what I want to do is I'm just going to copy it from the source code because it's a little bit easier uh, to get exactly what I want. So I'm going to have to redo that initial insert here. Uh, oops, sorry, where's it at? Uh, for computers, so we start out at 1, 2 again. So, notice we category computer has an ID of 30, but that doesn't really matter because the L values and right R values are not keys, they're just numbers. So, the fact that, you know, we've got a different ID shouldn't have any effect on anything else. Now, I'm going to try to call that procedure to create the nesting of all my stuff here. And notice, even though this is an itty bitty little database, we're getting times of like 0.13 seconds. This is an expensive little procedure here. So now we've got 1 to 60. Programming is 46 to 59. Graphics is 28 to 45. And the other is 2 to 27. Because of the way I put them in, you can see, oh, 2 to 27, 28 to 45, 46 to 59. Oh, those three are the second level that all fit inside of 1 to 60. And then if we go from, we'll say, 2 to 27, looking down here, any values that are below 27, um, and there's 11 to 16, uh, 24 to 25 is within that one, you can pretty well tell by looking at just the values what's nested inside of what. And if I had had to try to figure this all out myself instead of, <clears throat> shall we say, paying homage to the person who developed the procedure, because I didn't develop that. I just rewrote it to work with mine. Um, it would be a nightmare otherwise, because you basically have to keep the math correct or the nesting no longer has any meaning. Now, um, this is where I ran into, I understand some of the different things they turned on in 5.7 of MySQL. Um, and some of them are really pretty good. The, oh, I got the date format wrong. Oh, what does MySQL do prior to this? Oh, let's just put in some zeros. They'll find it later, right? Now, most sane databases would go, yeah, no. We're not doing that insert. We're not doing that update. You got the date wrong. Well, that's now how it behaves. So most of these worked just fine. But because there are a few features, especially things like, um, oh, full joins and a few other things that aren't truly in MySQL yet, you kind of take advantage of how group by is used. And one of the features they turned on was called only full group by. And that is the only feature they turned on that breaks some of the queries that you need for this. So I'm going to temporarily set the SQL mode to put everything in except for the only full group by. You could also change this in the my.comp file, but some people will just do this here. So this is just changing a variable for the session. It won't change it more permanently. And actually, do I really want to risk it? Well, let's check the next one. Oh, yep, okay. I don't trust myself anymore. So, I will just do it here. Ah, too many things open. Now, let's see what 
warnings it gave me just out of curiosity. Oh, I apparently forgot a couple that I didn't put in, but eh, whatever. It's a temporary change, so I'm not too worried about destroying anything. So, let's view the entire tree using a slight abuse of group by. So, we're going to concatenate and repeat uh, checks for the count of the parent category name minus one and some other fun little things with node. But effectively, this will recreate the tree and even basically space it out for us. Kind of cool. Oh, yep, don't do it here. And let's see if everything did paste in correctly. It should, though. So, well, yep, computer is the furthest over. Databases, graphics, and programming are indented next. NoSQL and SQL is under databases. Underneath NoSQL, we've got Sphinx, Cassandra, Mongo. Under SQL, we've got triggers, routines. And underneath routines, we have functions, procedures. Hey, like I said, retrieving the tree in uh, nested sets is pretty easy. Updating it, I, I did mention nightmarish, right? Yeah, it, it, it could be, potentially. So, I then, of course, created a uh, procedure to re remove a node and any descendants. Well, I'll phrase that. Again, for these, I basically lifted these and changed a few things to set it in. I, I haven't worked as much with nested sets before this, but I've always liked the idea. And the fact that I was able to work these out and get them working from that example that I linked at the beginning of this section, um, got to give them a lot of credit. Check it out. It's a good, good website. Um, but this does indeed work, and it will get rid of a particular branch. And I am most definitely not going to. That one's already in, so I'm not going to bother pasting it in. However, I'm now going to again pick on poor NoSQL. So if you look, um, I'm going to wipe that out. So I'm going to get rid of NoSQL and all of its kids, effectively, anything inside of it. And this is fairly easy to figure out because all I have to do is if their left value is greater than its left value, and its right value is less than its right value, boom, they're gone. Um, no. Apparently, I didn't get all of them in. Ah. I thought I did. And now I'll do this. Okay. And now. Let's get, there we go. So under databases, we have SQL and NoSQL and Cassandra and Mongo and Sphinx are gone. Um, as this is a, you know, MySQL talk, I guess it's fair they pick on MySQL at their talks. But we can put those back in. So we can fairly easily put the branch back. Just saying, you know, who's parent of what. So I have to put, obviously I need to put NoSQL as inside of databases. And then I can easily put uh, Mongo as inside of NoSQL, Cassandra is inside of NoSQL, and Sphinx is inside of NoSQL. I honestly do not know how you would handle nested sets without procedures and functions. I mean, it's just a pain otherwise. So, and let's go back, okay, and notice, hey, there's no SQL under databases again. There's Sphinx, Cassandra, and Mongo under uh, no SQL again. Boom. So, we can put it back pretty quickly. Yeah. But it's still kind of an expensive little set of queries going. Now, 
This one takes a little bit more work. Remember, I had the example where we had to find the parent ID of uh, the parent we're about to kill and then, you know, update it. For this, you kind of have to do things a little bit more carefully. So this one is we're going to remove a node but promote all the subnodes into the parent's parent, if you will. So effectively, we're going to take Cassandra and Mongo and Sphinx out of NoSQL, put them into databases, and then delete NoSQL. And yeah, I don't think I. Let's just make sure this one's already in there. I think it is, but I've been wrong before. Yep, okay, so it does already exist, good. And at the bottom of this, we're just going to pick on NoSQL again. And, ooh, why am I doing that? I do not trust myself. Hmm, numbers look the same. That's potentially a good option here. And I will rerun this query and see if it did what we wanted. So, yep, we have NoSQL is missing, and Sphinx, Cassandra, and MongoDB, which were under NoSQL, are now under databases. So it's pretty easy to retrieve the entire tree. Uh, removing a node or branch can make a lot of changes to the table. Inserting a new node or a new category or whatever you want to call it uh, can make nightmarishly huge changes to the, the table. Um, if it's a big table and you're inserting it towards the top of the tree, you're going to have to be doing updates on sometimes 98, 99% of every row in that table. So if you've got a setup that's not updated very rapidly, um, this might not be a bad way to go. One of the suggestions for this, and one of the places people use it, is for not just parts lists, but subcomponent lists. So say you've got an engine. Well, and whoops, just because it's easier to explain, even though no car that I know of has this anymore. You have the carburetor unit, which is one of the subunits. You may have the, you know, uh, the ignition, all these different little pieces that are made up of it. And then each of those is made up of pieces and so on. So not only do you have a parts list, but you have an idea of how the parts go together. And for a nested set, that's pretty good, because once you've got an engine designed, you're probably not going to be changing the parts very often maybe updating part numbers, but what part goes where probably isn't going to change for the life of that engine, in which case this could work. Um, again, some final thoughts. Nested sets, full tree is easy. Inserts can be very painful. Uh, great if the inserts and updates are infrequent. Oh yeah, parts list for machine assembly would be great. Adjacency list, inserts are very easy to do and very fast. Uh, retrieve the full tree usually takes some form of iteration or recursion. Uh, and again, it's probably best not done by the database itself. One of the path enumerations is that you do a query and you actually have an additional field that tells you what level it is. Is it the level 1 or level 2 or level 3 or level 4 or level 5? You have to run that periodically to update things, but that can help speed up getting the different levels instead of having to do so much iteration to figure out what's related to what. Um, so you've got that option. Closure tables, which I don't fully understand, but I've got a link in there if you're curious about it. I haven't tried them out yet. And modified adjacency lists. And again, almost every one of these sites cited this book. <laughs> um, and then said, and then we tried to do it so you could understand it. Adjacency lists versus nested sets for MySQL, graphs in SQL. This was a great 50-page paper. Some of it's definitely out of date, but it was done by somebody at a university and it disappeared. But thankfully, I didn't lose the link. So this is the Wayback Machine link 
to this PDF file. Um, I'm so glad it dis didn't disappear because I didn't think to make a copy of it. Um, and lots of other different little options. Now, what I was kind of working on back there is a modified one because one of the problems that you run into with the classic adjacent list and definitely nested sets is it really only allows one parent for a child. That doesn't really work for genealogy, right? Most, you know, most people, at least biologically, had two parents. Um, so, and I, this is not complete, even though I've got it sort of working at home. This uses the idea here is that you're going to have a category table with a list of category names, and it's just your typical, you know, lookup table. And then you have a different table that keeps track of the relationships, and those are done by foreign keys. Foreign key for the category ID points to cat ID, and the parent category ID also points in. So this way, any particular category can have as many parents as they want. Because I've effectively created a join table between two tables. Or many to many table, or intersecting entity, whatever you wish to call them. I like join tables. Um, some people like lookup tables. Either of those is fine. Intersecting entity just seems so, you know, confusing for folks. So in this case, doing a slightly more uh, different tree where under MySQL you've got procedures, functions, triggers, but hey, under Microsoft SQL there's procedures, functions, triggers. Under PostgreSQL there's procedures, functions, triggers. Now again, for this particular set of data you could probably do this in simpler ways or just simply do, you know, multiple categories in whichever one they have more than one. But if you were trying to keep track of links that are specifically procedures and functions under My Microsoft SQL and you wanted this kind of breadcrumb trail, you could do that. Again, I'd argue there's probably other ways to do it. Um, insert all your values into category name, and then you need a procedure that will basically take, you give it the name, give it the parent name. Uh, these are just the functions to look up the IDs. Here's the one to insert in. It's very similar to what I did before, just we've got a slightly different way of inserting it. And for new categories, and setting it up. And it, it does kind of work. But that's where I kind of ended this, is where I ended it at, uh, at scale. And this is just an introduction to it. There are other ways. One of the suggestions for nested sets, takes a little bit more work to set up, is instead of keeping everything tight, if you notice, there's no extra space. You can count one through 60 without missing a single number. Well, they argued that for your initial one, you should go from, say, if you figure that you're going to have uh, probably about 10,000 items, maybe make it go from 1 to 100,000. And then for the next level in, have everything go by, you know, hundreds or thousands and so on. I was going to give that as an example. So Zabbix goes through and has a unique ID for each category or unique group, and they actually started a billion for each different category. Granted, you've got a maximum usable normally of a couple thousand different categories, um, but they, they started as high as that in yep. order to have plenty of room in between two things. It does make the math for the inserts a little bit more confusing, but once you've got it set up, it's not a problem. But it, it speeds up inserts because you don't have to update every single other row in the table. So if you keep it tight like they originally had shown in the early nested set examples, that's where it's really expensive. But if you set it up where there's gaps of a 1,000 or more between every category, well, then you can just insert in between them without having to renumber everything. So I showed you, of course, the worst case scenario. But it's also what you, you kind of need to do that sometimes, especially with my students. Like, well, this is what happens if you do this. Oh, wow, that's, that's kind of costly, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it can be. Other questions? Well, hopefully it gave you something to think about.